Please note, this podcast series features graphic descriptions of forensic pathology techniques, violent crimes, accidents and traumatic incidents that some listeners may find distressing or upsetting. In modern Australia, bushrangers are generally held up as folk heroes, fighting for the oppressed 19th century working classes. But is this true? Taking examples such as Ned Kelly, Ben Hall and Captain Moonlight, Professor Bayard explains how modern forensic techniques and cutting-edge technologies have helped historians see these bush bandits in a whole new light. He also explains why having a Ned Kelly tattoo could be bad for your health. From the Advertiser, True Crime Australia and the University of Adelaide, this is Guardians of the Dead, a podcast exploring the ground where death and science meet. I'm Greg Barilla. Hi, I'm Elisa Black, and I'm here today with Professor Roger Bayard. And we're going to talk about bushrangers, real folk heroes, or just thugs. Hello, uh, Elisa. Well, where do you start? They're an interesting collection of people, and I think our, our interpretation of them nowadays is, is verging on the strange. Why the interest in bushrangers? Where did it start for you? Well, I've been interested in historical forensics, so using forensic pathology and forensic science to answer historical questions. Um, we've got very good techniques now that we haven't had before. And I'll talk about the bushrangers in terms of um, um, reconstruction of their fights with the police, using LIDAR, this really complicated laser technology, to work out who was standing where, where the bullets were going. And doing things like scanning electron microscopy to look at... Uh, the gun belt was thought to be Ben Hall's, to show whether the police version of events was true or not. I think there's a real understanding today that history is pretty subjective um, and it's not necessarily a, you know, a black and white truth of what happened at the time. And I think Ned Kelly is probably a really good example of that. In our state's history, Kelly is unique in his ability to generate debate and to polarise opinion. Ned fearlessly thumbed his nose at the establishment. To many, he was and remains a romantic figure who defied unjust authority. Let's face it, Ned was a criminal. Mythology around Ned Kelly is that he was a bit of a Robin Hood in Australia, but apparently that's not the case. Well, the thing about Robin Hood is he didn't steal from the poor and keep it himself. And that's what Kelly did. Obviously, some see him as a cold-blooded cop killer and others see him as some part of the uh, r- romantic Australian folklore. We know he was a cattle duffer and stole horses. Now, in rural Victoria, where he was, there weren't all that many squatters. So most of the people he was stealing from were actually small sharecroppers. You steal their one cow and one horse, and they starve. There's no Centrelink. And I don't think he cared. There's been a psychiatric evaluation of his behaviour, uh, and that's been published in the last few years, and he's a classic sociopath. If you, um, if you look at the gerildery letter that he dictated um, before he was hung... So what's, what, what is the Gerildery letter? I don't, it's it's sure a letter that, that he dictated um, just stating his position on you know, how he'd been persecuted by the police and what an upright fellow he was. But in that, he says anybody who opposes him, he wanted to actually tie them down over ant heaps, cut them open, take their fat, boil it, and pour it boiling down their throats. So, I mean, he's act- this, is what he, this is what he thought. He wanted the blood and the brains of the police to rain down. If he'd killed all those police officers at... Um, uh, drilldery, that would have been the biggest killing of police to date. You know, I'm a simple soul. I just think that killing serving police officers is not a good thing. How come everybody remembers Kelly's name? Very few people remember the, uh, the cops that he killed at Stringy Bark. Which myths about Ned Kelly have been disproven through modern forensics? Well, it's really an analysis of what happened. I mean, at, at Stringy Bark, he clearly ambushed the police. He waited for them. And uh, I was involved in a, a, a series of programs looking at these events. And we had one of his descendants um, at Stringy Bark. And I was asked, what do you think about the killing of Sergeant Kennedy? And Kennedy had been wounded and he'd run through the scrub 
and he was collapsed at the base of a tree. And I just said, when you shoot an unarmed man point blank in the chest, it's an execution. And Ned's relative said, well, I don't think we know that. I said, oh, I think we do. That's not a good thing to do. You know, one of the theories is he was putting Kennedy out of his misery. Why didn't he put him on a horse and just let the horse take him to, uh, get, to get medical help? He didn't do that. One of the other things, too, is that um, people say, well, Ned didn't shoot as many times as we think because what he did is he used to score bullets and they would open up and you get sort of two shots out of one bullet. We tested this at a uh, police firing range and the police ballistics expert and myself just said, oh, this is rubbish, it's not, it's not going to not going to open up. He fired it and sure enough, we did get two holes. So, you know, you could get two holes from one bullet, but that doesn't actually address the point as to why Ned was making hollow nose bullets, which make a terrible mess when they hit people. How accurate is a bullet when it's been cut in half like that? Oh, his gun was a shocker, actually. It had no sights on it. Uh, it really was, uh, was uh, not a... Uh, a good weapon, but he used it a lot, so he was experienced at shooting, and he managed to you know, shoot the police at Stringybark. So when you did this experiment, did you use one of those older guns, or was it using modern guns and rifles? No, what we did is we had a, a replica of his gun, and that was fired by a, a police um, a ballistics expert. How do people react when you challenge these ideas about Ned Kelly, that he was you know, the people's hero? What do people say when you change that, that thinking or that, that narrative? It's interesting. If I present this to a, a public gathering, I often ask who, who thinks Ned was a great bloke and nobody's come forward. Um, and yet in private conversations, people will say, oh, no, he was actually a freedom fighter. He wanted to set up an independent people's republic of northeastern Victoria. There is no evidence that that was going to happen. All he was doing is cattle doffing and killing people. But enough people think he was great to get his apparent words tattooed on their bodies. Well, such is life. <clears throat> he, he didn't say that. Nobody knows what he said. Um, but as for the Ned Kelly tattoos, it's interesting. I, I just noticed a few years ago that in cases that come for a medical legal autopsy... Which is after a, a crime or an assumed crime? No, this is just a... These are coronial cases, okay. so sudden deaths or whatever. But I, I noticed that there seemed to be a lot of um, violent deaths or natural deaths in the people that had Ned Kelly tattoos... And I think that um, I looked at about 30 cases, 85% of them had died of uh, accidents, drug overdoses, suicides or homicides. And if you look at the normal autopsy population, I think the suicide rate was almost three times higher and the murder rate was eight times higher. That doesn't say anything about the community. So just because somebody's got a Ned Kelly tattoo doesn't mean they're eight times more likely to be killed. But in a forensic context, it's bad news. Why bushrangers? What, what led you to looking into these cases? Well, Lisa, I've, over the years, I've always been interested in history. And so I've developed this area I call it historical forensics. And I've looked at the convicts down in Van Diemen's Land. And the bushrangers came up because uh, it was part of a, a documentary series that was analysing who they were and what they did. As we unearth the truth behind Australia's most infamous lawless legends. Uh, were they lawless men? And so that's why I got particularly interested. But then I could see the forensic aspects to it, which is really fascinating. Did you already have an idea of what kind of people they were before you went into that work, before you started investigating? I've always been suspicious about uh, Ned Kelly, I must admit, but I didn't really know. And the other bush rangers too were... were were fascinating. And for example, Ben Hall, I really didn't know much about him at, at all. Well, I don't either. So tell us a bit about who, I guess, who Ben Hall was, first of all. Well, he was a uh, basically a, a criminal. Um, he and Frank Gardner robbed the uh, Yagara um, coach, I think they got £14,000. And then he and his uh, gang um, were involved in over 100 robberies and, and two police officers were killed. The interesting thing is, People know Ben Hall's name, but nobody knows the names of the victims. Now, how strange is that? I, I don't understand it. But there are a whole lot of questions about what, how, how Ben Hall had died. And we were able to use modern techniques, forensic techniques, to actually uh, clarify that. What were the legends about how he died? Well, there's two theories about how he died. One is the, the popular version that the cowardly police 
snuck up on him while he's sleeping in his swag and just emptied their weapons into him. Um, the Streets of Forbes is a beautiful song written by, I think it was a relative of uh, Hall's, and it just talks about him like a dog being shot down. A man of good renown Who was hunted from a station And like a dog shot down The police version uh, is a little different. I was going to say some things don't change. Um, but what they say is that they were actually waiting in ambush. And he came out. They called on him to halt. He didn't. He ran. And then Trooper Hipkiss fired a .56 rifle. He was waiting in ambush as well. Which went through Hall's gun belt, causing it to drop off and, and basically killed him. Now, there are discrepancies in the police story. Um, in the first version... They say he had nothing in his hands. The second version, they say he had a pistol. I don't think he had a pistol because it wasn't fired. Um, they also emptied their weapons into him. Then there was the Felons Apprehension Act because the colony was pretty scared of these, these bush rangers. You know, they, were, they were worried about anarchy. And so they passed this law that said that you could shoot a bush ranger on sight, but it actually hadn't come into hadn't been enacted at the time of uh, Hall's shooting. So there's been a whole lot of legal arguments going on. But I was lucky enough to be able to examine the belt. And uh, this was at the Powerhouse Museum. And so they had a belt there that had a hole in it. And I said, well, I don't think it's a bullet hole. Nobody had actually put the edges together. So I put the edges together and I was amazed. It was an oval defect with shelving that matched perfectly a bullet hole. The only position that you could actually fire that from was behind and to the left where Hipkiss was. So then we've got the, the belt. There's no obvious material on it, but we took it for scanning electron microscopy, which is a really complicated technique that looks at elements. And we found lead around the bullet hole, a lot of lead in the ammunition pouch, none on the front of the... Um, the belt, so it wasn't as if it had been contaminated by his hands. We also found silver and mercury and antimony. These are accelerant or used as accelerants in 19th century weapons. So effectively, we proved it was a bullet hole. The angle that it was fired from fitted perfectly the police story. So I think the police story is correct. So was that a belt that he wore, you know, to hold his pants up, or was it across his chest, where on his body? No, it was it around it? his around his waist. It was a gun belt. What year did all this happen? That's 1865, so it was a fair while ago. To be looking at artefacts that are that old, how relevant are they still? How accurate are they to what had happened, you know, 150 years ago? Well, it's interesting because, you know, in looking at it, um, the belt, I just looked and said, oh, it's just a, it's a torn belt. Um, so one of the things we did is we actually got a, a gelatin torso um, and we went down to Little River near Geelong. There's a, a firing range. And we put a belt around that and we, we fired, or the police ballistics guy fired, with a 0.56 19th century gun and could replicate what we found in that belt. So we could show by an enactment that it occurred. And then with the scientific analysis of all the elements, it basically proved it was a bullet hole um, and it fitted the story perfectly. I have sometimes wondered about those gelatin figures like how close to an, shooting an actual person is the result and like would a bullet penetrate as far or do you they're useful to a point you know they're, clearly they're not tissues and we i've done research on this looking at sort of surrogates to use to to match different organs because you can imagine you've got the liver and that's next to the stomach that's next to the spine and they're all different densities so it's an artificial situation but in this case we just wanted to see whether a life-size figure with that belt could actually have that result. So if you could build your perfect fake body to shoot something into, what would you build all the organs out of? You can use a variety of, of different things. I mean, you can use plastics for bone. Um, you can use pig skin for skin. Um, some people have been looking at sponges, sea sponges. So it's a question of As just... For what, for what part of the body? Just um, internal organs in general. Um, so essentially, the experiments we did, we got pig livers, and we got surrogate material, gelatins, and we just wanted to see, did the bullet penetrate to the same depth? Um, was the track the same? So you can compare the two. But it's, um, it's a reasonably rough science. We'll be right back. 
this is a bit of a sideways step from bush rangers, but also you see when they do a you know a drawing of what somebody might have looked like when you just find bones. How I know, I guess it's probably hard to know, but how accurate are those drawings? Uh, they're not accurate. <laughs> I mean, because That's we we don't know. I mean, there you know people argue. The, the facial reconstructionists think they're magnificent. What I would like, and I've asked for years, is I would like to get um, 10 skulls from donated bodies and get the photographs of these people, you know, with permission from the families, and get the reconstructionists to make what they think the person looked like. And then we compare the two. Now, as that hasn't been done, it says to me that it probably can't be done. Because, you know, you know skin thickness, muscle thickness... Um, expression. I mean, you just can't capture that. I think what it does, though, and where it has been useful is it sometimes prompts people's memories. So if somebody's gone missing or, you know, been seen at a bus stop or something like that, by doing the reconstruction, you sometimes get people coming forward and they say, actually, I do remember there was a car there uh, that night and it was, you know, a white Holden or something like that. So, you know, I don't dismiss it entirely. Uh, I just think it's it's just one facet of a whole lot of things in, in identifying people. I wonder as well if it's hard for people to empathise with some bones, but if you give somebody a face to care about, then suddenly people are perhaps more likely to, you know, put pressure on police or whoever to push a case through to keep the pressure on to solve these things. I, th- I think it. Um, I think the police are always pressured to get this done. They're, they're very um, committed in my experience, but I think it does engage the community. And you will get more people coming forward to Crime Stoppers and stuff like that. Listening to you talk about examining, you know, the hole in the belt, it does make me wonder about how those skills are used sort of across history. You get a, a, an artifact that's 150 years old, or you get um, somebody like Samantha O'Reilly that we've already spoken about, and how you apply those skills and find them as useful, no matter who it is you're investigating. Well, I think the advantage we have is we have got so much modern science and techniques and we also are used to doing very complex reports about direction of, of bullet holes. So with uh, Hall, I actually did a body chart and we, we plotted where bullets might have gone. Um, the autopsy reports back in the 19th century were really, really short. What, yeah. what, what, what would they say? Oh three bullet holes, something like that, or 30 bullet holes. Um, so with Captain Moonlight, who was involved in the killing of Constable Webb Bowen, I had to sort of plot from the description of the observers at the scene and work out what I thought had happened looking at where the bullet ended up. And so I had an entrance point in the left side of the neck and it was the bullet ended up on the right side of the neck so it would have gone through part of the spine and it took him four days to die, so he presumably died of infection. So we can we can work that through. That's not stated in any of the reports. We had to sort of synthesise all of that. So speaking about Captain Moonlight, where was he based? What did he do? Why is he famous? More infamous. Uh, his name was um, George Scott, and he was a very odd fellow. Um, he ended up wandering the countryside with a, uh, a group of young men walking from Melbourne north. And on one hand, he was quite a gentleman. On the other hand, he was, again, a thug. He, he held up a, um, a station near Wantabadgery and treated everybody to grog and feasting and then went out and shot the um, owner's prize horse. And I believe the owner said just you know, any other animal, not this one. And, of course, being inept... He didn't kill it. Somebody else had to come and do the job properly. Then he goes up to Wanda Badgery, and there's a siege. And this is where Constable Webb Bone gets, gets killed. But the question is, who did, who did the killing? And so what we did is we went to Wanda Badgery, and I was working with an archaeologist, Adam Ford. And Adam has this incredible LIDAR box, which is a, it's a, um, a box that shoots out a whole lot of laser beams that then come back and you can then take this to the computer, so Monash, which has this curved surround, and you can project Wanda Badgery. Now, when we're at Wanda Badgery, it was 40 plus degrees, there was dried sheep dung everywhere. When we're at Monash, it was about 20 degrees and we had coffee. So, you know, Monash was much nicer than Wanda Badgery. We use LIDARs in, in crime scene reconstructions now. Uh, I've had uh, a case 
a year or so ago when uh, the forensic response cops had a LIDAR, which they then brought back to me, and they took me through the front door of the house, down the corridor, into the lounge room. You could see the body on the couch. They, they brightened it, and then they put the LIDAR up through the roof like a drone. It, just unbelievable technology. So the stuff that we use in our current cases, we then applied to Wanda Badgery. And so what we had, oh, and then Adam did some excavating, and he found where the farmhouse was and where the kitchen was. And we knew that there were three bush rangers in the kitchen. Rogan, who was hung with moonlight for killing Constable Webb Bowen, Rogan was hiding under the bed. They found him a day or two later. He didn't fire a shot, but didn't help him. He was one of the older ones, so that's why he, um, I think, went the way he did. Gus Warnicke was uh, out exposed. He was 15. He'd been shot through the liver. And then moonlight was going backwards and forwards between the... Uh, uh, basically the kitchen and shooting at the, the police. When we did the reconstruction, put it all together, and this is LIDAR, you, you can actually, you, you can take off vegetation. You can move around the scene. It's extraordinary. But when we put it together, the three bush rangers in the kitchen didn't have a line of fire on Webb Bowen. The only two who did, Moonlight and Gus Warnicky. And Gus, the 15-year-old, was dying. When I actually put the trajectory of the bullet his last act was to shoot Webb Bowen in the neck. So it was the youngest who was the killer. Wasn't Moonlight because he was guilty because he was the leader. Certainly wasn't Rogan. When you speak to historians about these things that you've found, how do they react when you're challenging these ideas that they've held on to for however long? Uh, the only historians I know are reasonable people who find it interesting. Um, I'm working with uh, Hamish Maxwell Stewart, who was a professor of history down in Hobart on the convict material. And, you know, we work very well together. I think um, collaboration with people in different disciplines is really the way to go. And there's no way that they could have actually done the stuff that I've done with the pathology. And I had to be given the historic scenario with them and then Adam doing the excavation. So it all fitted in, you know, really, really nicely. What value is there into looking into something that happened so long ago? Why, why bother? Well, I think people, people want to know the answers. And I think with something like um, Ned Kelly, um, the historical record as perceived by most people is incorrect. He was not a good man. The father of four was one of three police officers gunned down by Ned Kelly and his gang. Murdered by an evil and despicable criminal group. And that's what they were. They were murderers, thieves, um, a great risk to the community. And he caused a lot of suffering. And so I think that that's, it's important to clarify that. And it's relatively easy to do once you sort of get into it and, and do the analysis. So I think it just means that there's so much more depth to forensics than just working in a mortuary. We talked about disaster victim identification. I was involved in looking at remains in Berlin. Um, they found when the wall came down, 26,000 fragments of bone from probably the Battle of Berlin. And over the last 10 years, they've done 44 identifications. And so that's historical DVI, but it's really important. There was a, a plane found outside Hamburg. A farmer came to the Institute and just said, oh, there's a Junkers plane in my backyard. I haven't told anybody about it because I didn't want you digging up the place, but I'm retiring now, so you can do what you want. And they found the remains of a pilot. He was based in Viborg during the war. He'd been married for three weeks and he disappeared. And his wife had remarried. She was a grandmother with grandchildren, but she was able to bury him, you know, after half a century. And she said that was one of the most meaningful experiences. So you can help people. If we look at the Ned Kelly story again, I met a descendant of Sergeant Kennedy He's a lawyer in Melbourne. And that's really what initiated the programs we did because he was saying to the producer how it feels to go to his relative's grave and find Kelly memorabilia. And he said it really is still an ongoing um, source of distress for the family. So although it's a long time ago, you know, we can still help. And I think he found our reenactments and analyses are uh, useful. 
you know, closure is a word that's used loosely, but I think it does sometimes give people closure. And it also stops them perhaps believing the wrong things about history. Do you find that everybody accepts that truth, though? There's some people that are so wedded to that narrative about these folk heroes being the true heroes that they refuse to disbelieve what they already think about Nick Kelly. Oh, absolutely. Um, I actually, as part of uh, the series, interviewed a young bloke who's getting a Ned Kelly tattoo uh, down in uh, Melbourne. And uh, he, he was in tears talking about Kelly. Uh, he said Kelly was picked on as a kid. I was picked on as a kid. You know, he stood up for himself. He's a larrikin. Um, you know, never let yourself be confused by the facts. Guardians of the Dead is brought to you by The Advertiser, True Crime Australia and the University of Adelaide. The show is produced by myself, Greg Barilla. Elisa Black is your host. Mixing and sound design by Emily Dore. Make sure you're following Guardians of the Dead on your favourite podcast app. And if you enjoyed it, be sure to leave us a review. Next time, Professor Bayard explains how even herbal remedies can kill, how what people thought were natural were anything but, and makes a case for stronger regulation. I'm Greg Barilla. Thanks for listening.